Welcome to RGBA, Colorful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 67. My name is Alexandre Valier Lagasse, and I'm joined by my co host, Tadimina. So last week, if you remember correctly, we we assigned me a homework to do. Yes, I did. I, I had to open a Nespresso cup to to investigate and see if the coffee is tamped or if the coffee is just purely dropped in this little cup thing. And if you look in the show notes, you'll see a few pictures uh, that I took. Uh, basically, the coffee is not tamped. So it's uh, something that is similar to espresso grind, so pretty fine grind. Um, maybe slightly, slightly smaller than regular espresso. So let's see. For example, on my uh, my Barazza Virtuoso espresso is set to four normal, normally. So probably this is a two or three. Uh, so it's not all the way down to one, but it's probably a th- two or three. Yeah. And one thing that I realized after that, I said, okay, let let me do some experiments. So I took the coffee from the the opened Nespresso cup and I put it inside the uh, uh, coffee duck uh, capsule. And what I realized is that when I finished filling the little uh, little cup and tamped the coffee, I was still left with lots of coffee. So what uh, I did not realize this at first, but the coffee duck uh, capsules are way smaller than the Nespresso cup themselves. So I was, if you look at the picture, I was able to fill it completely, tamp the coffee at the maximum level I could fill, and I still have maybe uh, one fourth to one third of a cup left uh, on my oven. So that's uh, pretty impressive to see um, that so much coffee fits in such a small capsule. And also I did one more test. I basically did a coffee with a regular cup and with a a coffee duck filled with the Nespresso coffee. And this did not go well. (laughs) The, uh, I don't have the, the, photos yet but i'll put it in the show notes um basically the nespresso uh cup coffee has the crema as you know that's one of their signature uh features but the same coffee in a co- in a coffee duck capsule is totally different there is like no crema uh, the coffee looks semi-transparent and was frankly tasting very bitter so uh, i don't think the coffee that they use for the nespresso cup is a versatile all-around espresso uh, coffee. It, it's probably just uh, made for and perfected for Nespresso capsules because of the amount of coffee in there. It's also it tastes, it tastes a little bit more. And because of the way that the filter receives the water and ejects the coffee, it's probably all those variables are optimized for it. So the big news uh, that happened very early uh, this week, or did, did it happen last week? No, this week. Uh, this week, yeah, this week. So there was one of the worst um, vulnerability that was discovered on the Wi-Fi protocols. Uh, if you remember a few years back, the WEP, WEP protocol was compromised, meaning that you could very easily, and after not too long, in a few seconds, uh, discover the Wi-Fi password of any WEP network. So this triggered a change where people were already shipping routers with WPA, and soon after it was WPA2, which was supposed to be even safer. And like the whole industry moved to that WPA standard, took maybe like a year or two. Uh, but then again, in that time, uh, the Wi-Fi was getting started. Like it was, it was popular, but not everyone had Wi-Fi, and it was like starting to get to a point where people were starting to go to like their their staples or their Best Buy and buy a router of the shelf. So it was not so bad in terms of a problem, but this week the very worst thing that could happen, happened. We are in 2017, routers and Wi-Fi networks are omnipresent, like at home, at work, in the park even, Uh, and now WPA2 protocol has been compromised. Uh, Without getting too technical, basically there's some kind of handshake that happens between a computer and a Wi-Fi network. And in when when a... uh, a hacker gets in the middle, he can basically interact with this handshake. I think it's a, there's three steps. So it's just a second step, step that the hacker can interact and basically become kind of a, 
uh, a man in the middle and become the Wi-Fi network. And if you connect to that Wi-Fi, you are actually connecting to that hacker. So everything you do on the network can be sniffed by this person. This does not necessarily include HTTPS though. Uh, most of the websites have HTTPS. And if the hacker is using a feature called SSL stripping, which basically strips the secured uh, certificate from the connection, well, then you can be exposed. But most of the websites like Facebook and other stuff like that, they basically realize that and they don't allow you to go further if you're not on HTTPS. But some other websites, so maybe your bank, for example, who might not be as secure as other iTech companies, uh, might basically allow you to go through with HTTP only tra traffic. And in this case, everything is exposed. Like every single character you type in every single field, everything that's displayed on, on the, the screen will be intercepted. So we are now at a situation where we have dozens, if not more, companies uh, making routers and wireless products. I'd and they basically have, yeah, probably in the, maybe in the hundreds. And they basically have to issue a firmware update for each and every router, but also each and every device you own. Because if you patch your home network, for example, but then you go to the Starbucks, your local Starbucks, and they don't patch their software and your device is not patched either, then you are still exposed. So you need to patch everything. So the big names of the in the game, like Linksys, are on it. Uh, Apple has already uh, published a fix in the 11.1 .1 beta for iOS and the 10.13.1 for macOS. So it should come out of beta in the coming week or two, at the very less, at uh, very uh, least. Um, Microsoft already patched Windows last Tuesday. So basically, like one day after this was discovered, it was already in the Tuesday patch. So that's great. Uh, but there's a bunch of companies that have like either not responded to press requests uh, asking for a update or timelines. And just think about it, like how many routers are in your relative's house and they are not going to be updated because they're from like seven or eight years ago. So this will be a real show. Because you can't just update your phone, right? It's not enough. Because they were saying maybe in some certain cases the phone might do or just like the the device that connecting that it's connecting to the router might do. Yes, it could be enough, but there's a bunch of other uh, side hacks, if you want, like SSL stripping. So there's a bunch of those that can also interfere. So it's it's hard to to really say like, okay, this device is safe and not this one because it's down to the browser, to the, the way that the iPhone does a connection, and there's a bunch of other factors. So just to be on the safe side, update everything. And if you cannot update your stuff, uh, probably in the coming days, I think there's a big conference, a big uh, Black Hat conference going on soon. The researcher who found the problem will be releasing scripts to exploit this vulnerability. Right, so, that's an important part because there's no scripts in the in the wild if you want right now, right? Yes, yes, exactly. There's only one or two videos from a researcher or other researchers who um, confirmed his findings. So it's very like research based. So basically they, 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 they confirm each other's work just to be sure that it's well documented and well uh, established. So yeah, for example, uh, Austin Evans, a famous tech YouTuber, basically uh, showed us a demo of this hack going on with uh, a tech uh, security researcher who basically compromised his local network in his office and showed exactly what kind of information was being displayed on the hacker screen uh, when they were doing their, their little magic there. So it's it's pretty scary. Uh, people are saying that this is not to be taken uh, lightly. Uh, it can have major impacts uh, with even the recent hacks we had with Equifax. Uh, yes, your data is already out, di out there, but imagine some hacker being able to get into your bank account and doing some interact uh, wire transfer to their accounts. Uh, that would be also pretty bad, especially if they make a recurrent transfer every time you get a, a new pay. So what can you do? Uh, in the show notes, there's a link to a uh, website that tracks uh, comments and updates from different vendors. So you are able to see if your uh, router uh, brand is on it or is just being lazy or whatever. And this is one of the rare occasions where I say, if you don't have an update in the coming week or two, uh, you might never see one. Basically, your router company will probably just not 
update your model or will probably not update any model or maybe just their very very recent ones like released this year or last year at the at, at most so you can be very very easily exposed and this is not just like uh people will have to come to my house no they are special equipment that you can buy with off-the-shelf part and they use that to make a run by wi-fi attack so basically people just drive around in their neighborhood in your neighborhood and they just stop house by house and scan the Wi-Fi networks. And then once they found one that they can hack, they just stay there for a couple of, of minutes or they just come back at the most uh, busy time of the day where people are on their uh, computers and they just watch the whole network traffic and steal whatever they can. Yeah, we used to do that just for fun in uh, in school. We'd take our laptops, go in the car and drive around old neighborhoods and we found like a bunch of WEPA networks. So we cracked the web network, web, web networks, but it was just for fun. We didn't do anything like stupid or crazy. But it, this is gonna be possible again since the WPA two is now like half compromised. If you want, yeah. So hopefully you are not too much affected by this. Uh, I would strongly uh, urge you to do your updates. And log into your admin uh, console of your router if the password is admin admin change that also <laughs> uh, <laughs> because there was, there's way too many people just driving by and changing those for you and you just need to reset your router every time so basically do, do your updates do your password changes for the router and uh, all your devices like tablets phones computers uh, even if you have a uh, smart devices like wemo switches uh, 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 philips u bulbs everything like just make sure you are up to date. Take like a half after. Take take a afternoon, for example, a Saturday, and just do all your updates. And if it's not possible, if you're in a situation where your vendor doesn't do crap about you, uh, well, sadly, you'll need to purchase a new router. So from that same list, you can see which companies have already patched their softwares, and you can basically just buy one of their products. So you can see that first they are behind their products, and second they are quite transparent and they work fast. So that's always a good situation. So the the one thing that I'm 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 scared though is that nowadays most people, uh, like not geeks like us, but most like regular folks, they basically use the internet provider a router, and I'm not sure how fast this one will be patched, like your Vitro, Vitron, your Bell, your AT and T, whatever, your FiOS uh, router, everything, all those things, will they be patched quickly, or will that takes uh, take this company months to patch it? Uh, I, I'm really wondering. I think it's it's even like it might even be better that people are using that. I think it's going to be patched quicker and easier. Also, like it, they're always set to automatic and nobody changed them, so it's going to be set. It's going to be like updated before people update their Linksys router that they have at home or or anything like that. Yes, I I would really really hope so. Uh, that auto update thing is a pretty good uh, setting. Uh, those company who do not have those setting on right now will bite their nails and they will probably enable it for future updates. And also, I think the really the biggest problem is the super public uh, like airports and all that. Yeah, th this will be quite something. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing Starbucks will probably be behind. They probably like offer like uh, standard equipment to their coffee shops. So basically they can issue some internal memo and here's a step to update your, your Wi-Fi thingies. So that's not too bad, but I'm more worried about the independent uh, coffee shop owner who has like the cheapest Linksys or D-Link router he could find when he opened this coffee shop like seven years ago. This will be the real place where the problems will occur. Anyways, it's not uh, so bad if you have a good company. Uh, for example, uh, right now I'm testing the Eero Pro Wi-Fi uh, mesh network. And I think it took only two days for them to patch the crack vulnerability with a K. So they're pretty fast on it. I don't know about the other uh, companies, but usually in senses, uh, it's usually fast for those kind of things. Uh, I'm more worried about the smaller guys and all those Chinese cheap Wi-Fi routers that people find on AliExpress for like 10 bucks. These will never be patched. So moving on to happier news, uh, Microsoft unveiled the Surface Surface Book 2. So the hinge is now fixed. So that's a good thing. The wobbly hinge that people were complaining about last year, this one is basically fixed. And we now have a 15-inch version. So that's pretty great. Um, I, I don't 
I don't really have a need for a Surface Book, but if you are in the Windows camp and you need or want absolutely a Microsoft, well, a Windows computer, uh, I've always said that the Surface line of computers was always the one to get. It really is reminiscent of the uh, MacBook Pro or the Google Pixel, so it's high quality parts, more expensive than useful uh, than usually. Sorry, and uh, more, but but <laughs> more expensive than useful. Yeah, that's a that's, a horrible that's pretty review. bad. Yeah, exactly. Imagine the the big titles. <laughs> so yeah, uh, basically the good thing about those computers is that they are usually pretty configurable. They start in a very affordable price with very like low end parts, like a core i five with a uh, slow CPU, but go all the way to a quad core uh, i seven with uh, with uh, uh, four gigahertz and lots of ram lots of ssd so usually you can get your you can find your sweet spot uh, in the price range that fits your budget did you ever try the surface book uh yes my mom has a surface i forget the name it's with the cheap super cheap keyboard and she really loves them so but i don't know if why she doesn't get a surface book i think just because it's too big to carry around in her purse or her briefcase but she really yeah, loves her surface with the little like mesh keyboards that i don't know how she works on all day but she's a fan yeah yeah the new one is lighter though it's only 4.2 pounds if you compare it to a macbook pro which is 4.02 pounds so it's only 0.2 pounds heavier than a macbook pro so that that's easy to try to transport and to to carry around um it also has a nvidia gtx 1060 gpu so it's a much better than the 15 inch macbook pro radeon 555 and 560 560 gpus so, and if she needs something light, the 13 inch is only 3.3 pounds. So that's uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, if you want the GPU then, which you probably will not get, no. it adds another 300, uh, uh, sorry, 0.3 uh, pounds. Because right now she has, is it the, just the, like the Surface tablet and then you can stick on the scr- the keyboard, like this full keyboard instead of the little felt one that she uses? That was a Surface, uh, the original Surface. Now the Surface Book it comes with a keyboard that has an inch, so you can adjust the angle like a real laptop. So it's a bit different product than the original Surface. But she has like a bunch of Surfaces. <laughs> so for pricing, it starts at uh, $1,500 US for a Core i5 13-inch with integrated graphics card and... 2500 for a 15 inch model but you can always go like one step higher with a core i7 and a discrete gpu but then the price goes into the 3000s and more so not a cheap affordable computer by no means but if you want a windows machine that is super nice design super powerful uh, I, I think that this is the laptop to get uh, they don't cheap out on components either so you know you'll get great performance a great battery life, a great keyboard, because Microsoft is known for their peripherals. So for me, the Surface Book is the computer to get if you really want a, a Windows machine. Okay. I, Surface Pro 3, I think. Okay. So next up, I thought about you when I when I saw this this review. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly which one it was, but I know you use this kind of slider in your review also. I think it was a, of your your, um, your camera versus the iPhone. Yeah, when I did my my portrait mode versus a uh, Sony uh, A7 II camera, I put in place exactly this kind of a it's, a... it's like if two pictures are one on top of the other, and there's a slider you can go from left to right and reveal one photo or the other. Okay, so the article we're talking about is Tom's Guide. They did a review of the um, 8 Plus, the iPhone 8 Plus versus a Pixel 2. It's the Pixel 2 XL or the Pixel 2 regular? The Excel, so big versus big. Right. So, and then it's like you just said, they took uh, the same picture of uh, something, like a bunch of things, and then they have the slider. So you can slide around the picture and see the difference between each um, camera side by side. Um, I, there, it's really, some pictures I prefer the iPhone, some pictures I prefer the Google Pixel. I would rather if they wouldn't tell me and they'd switch them around like sometimes the iPhone would be on the right and sometimes on the left to make it really like random. Uh, yeah. I think MKBHD had this kind of little test to see which one you prefer with, without the names. And it was just referring to like letters or numbers for each camera. 
but yeah, overall, exactly. it's really nice. Like the pictures are really, really nice. Yeah, and and if it's one or the other, the the main difference would be that I think the Pixel Two better handles uh, HDR and also better handles uh, low light situations, which is something that the iPhone still struggles. It's way better than before, so don't get me wrong. We are light years ahead of where we were like three years ago, but uh, there are still some situations where you realize that even though you have the big iPhone with the big lens and everything and you have the HDR enabled and everything, you still get some crappy shots. Uh, one example is the, um, what's it called? The, the the triangular building there in New York. Uh, tam, uh, tam, 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 tam. The Not the iron. iron thingy, yeah, whatever. So <laughs> flat iron. You can see flat iron exactly. So this picture exactly encompasses what I'm talking about. The iPhone 8 has great sky, great blue, great contrast. You can see the uh, light part on the building and the shadowy part. You say, okay, this is a perfect picture. But then when you slide over to the Pixel 2, you can see that the exact same picture is exposed exactly the same way. So you basically have the same um uh the same uh, sharpness in the uh sunlit zone but then you look at the shadow zone and you see a lot more details so even though the iPhone 8 looked like it has a great picture this one has an even better picture so that's what i said when i mean that they have a better low light uh, low light uh, capabilities is that those shadowy parts the parts in your picture which are which are usually like a bit darker and less detailed well, the Pixel seems to be better handling those. And also on a side note, uh, there's a dedicated HDR chip in the Pixel that is not yet activated. Uh, I should st- I should find the article for it. I think it was um, iFixit who discovered it. Uh, there's basically like a chip, like a full-fledged like CPU chip, dedicated CPU just for image processing in the Google Pixel 2. And this chip is not yet enabled. Google says that it will be enabled in the coming months. Uh, I'm guessing that they probably f- did not have time to fine tune this uh, processing unit, but uh, it's going to add HDR plus, they say, which will be uh, ten times less battery intensive and like five times faster than what they have right now. So I tried my friend's uh, Pixel Two, not the XL, the regular one, uh, for photos, and it was already focusing quite fast and. When you were activating the portrait mode, it was a bit slower, which makes sense because it needs to think more. But I'm just thinking that if this chip can also handle portrait mode, uh, it will be as fast as taking regular pictures, which will be awesome. So yeah, uh, end of the parenthesis. This was this is something that it's pretty impressive to see, like a hidden chip just for that, that will eventually be enabled and offer a lot more capabilities. So looking at the other pictures, uh, the zoom pictures, so they are basically taking a... Uh, a photo of the, I think that's the Empire State Building. Uh, same thing again. Uh, the Apple photos seems very nice, very sharp, everything, very lit. But then you look at the uh, Google Pixel photo and it's basically just a tad bit darker. Uh, the contrast is a bit n- lower. So in that situation, it was a well lit photo then the iPhone handles it better. So it really depends on the situations. But if you get one or the other, I'm, I'm guessing that it makes no difference. You, you'll basically have great photos every time. Uh, and if not, it's not something that cannot be fixed in post. You can always go over your photos after that and fix the colors and the light, the, the, the brightness or the brightness of the dark zones. So all this can be fixed. And did you say that it wins six to four? No, not yet. <laughs> In the end, spoilers. Yeah. yeah, spoilers. If you want to go to the the end of the um, the little test, where they tested basically about ten situations, it's six to four for the iPhone. So, yeah, it's a it, it makes sense. Uh, but I'm curious to see this, ex- this exact same test in a few weeks or months when that separate chip is enabled. What it will achieve. But like when we talked about the DXO Mark thing, it's so. Like pictures are so subjective, sub subjective or objective, subjective. Subjective, yeah. It's it's pretty much just what you prefer, and and it's good that the both have like super good cameras, so everybody's gonna be t- taking super good pictures, and that's what I get out of this. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Uh, these are amazing cameras, amazing devices. 
And I don't think you will be in a situation where you will say that, oh, I wish I had the other one. Yeah. Because like I said, it, the difference is so minimal. Everything can be fixed in post-production. So it's not a big deal. Whereas something that's a big deal is keyboards. And people are complaining about their keyboards. Started with a couple of people having troubles with some of their keys. Uh, start, it started, I think, a few weeks after the 2016 were released. And basically, people had stuck keys. And the solution for that, since this is now the super thin uh, butterfly switch, is to basically hold the computer at a what was like a 45 degrees angle, shoot air from the left, and then put it upside down at like 70 degrees and then shoot air, compressed air from the left. So basically there's like a whole complicated routine to just get these dust particles out of your keyboard. And people complained and people are even having more problems where that the keys are actually broken broken, and the they basically just like stick or they don't work at all. So people get their keyboard replaced because that's under warranty. So that was in 2016. And moving on 2017, people are still having problems. And uh, there, there's even like um, crazy articles like uh, this one from Casey uh, Johnson for writing for the outline. The title is The New MacBook Keyboard is Ruining My Life. <laughs> and uh, we also have like um, Stephen Ackett from 512 Pixels saying there is no I in keyboard because his I letter is uh, broken. Popped off. Same thing. Yeah, popped off. Same thing for uh, for Marco Armand had problems with his laptop, which is now in the hands of Mike Hurley. So they all will get their keyboards replaced in the end. So it, it will eventually be fixed. But how long will it take for the second, the next keyboard to be also broken? So that's what I'm wondering. And I don't think they, they don't remove the, they don't replace the whole keyboard. They replace, they put little things on the keys have like extra bushings that they put on the keys it, they had like a cold in a code internally that was passing around the web so you can go into the apple store and say like hey can i have the the macbook pro uh special squishy keys please replace. so they take off all of the keys and they replace them well they add some bushings to them yeah that's what i understood or they change like the butterfly switches because they can't replace the whole keyboard it's hmm. they have to that's replace the whole case yeah, well, I don't know how, how tightly integrated that is, but they would yeah need to go from the underside and remove everything all the way to the keyboard because that's usually the last part that you remove. So, But still, it, it, it's troubling that this keyboard has so much problems in less than two years. Uh, so hopefully this will be fixed f f and they have like a new keyboard or keys set up that they replace. That will not break, but I, I'm afraid that in three months we'll hear from the same people again with the same problem. So that, that's what I've always tell people. Uh, I know you purchased a 2016 laptop, and for now, no problem with your keys. Uh, yes, I have the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you do? <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you. I, I, no, I was trying to be ho hopeful, like to at least one people. Oh, yeah, my friend has the good one. My friend has the yeah, good exactly. One. It's not everyone who has one, but now I think everyone I know who has one, they have problems. No, yeah. Oh, uh, a couple of times I have to, like the um, the space bar, a couple of times, and then just random letters on the keyboard. They get jammed, and you press on them, and they don't move anymore. So you have to. I didn't have to use the can yet, but I just blow in the keyboard like an idiot in a train, and it works. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like it's like when you get lint stuck in your your iPhone charging port, lightning port. Same yeah. thing. But now it's in my keyboard. Jeez. Yeah. And and, and you see the the thing that I was be wondering is, should we even try? You know those uh, hurricane uh, can? Uh, uh, what is it called? The it's compressed air, but it's not a uh, chemical. It's a kind of a compressor that compresses air in a cylinder. It's battery powered. And it can shoot air at 200 uh, miles per hour. So I, I would suggest to use that because it's less chemicals. But then again, I'm wondering, that's so powerful. Maybe it's going to rip your keys apart. <laughs> so, yeah. it's it's Because it, those little butterfly switches, they're so fragile. They're so tiny and so, so like, there's no, like, you remember a few, like, like a decade ago, I had a Dell laptop and the keys were popping off constantly. But they were so thick and so big, I was able to just reinsert them and just 
press very hard and it would just click back into place. But if you do anything remotely close to that with your Mac keyboards nowadays, it's so tiny and so small that you need like microscopic tools basically to just reattach stuff together. You would just break the sh** of those keys. So yeah, it's not a, not a great situation. And just to top this off, uh, our favorite uh, songwriter and uh, and uh, artist, Jonathan Mann, even put out a song uh, in his YouTube channel. It, it's uh, very fun, and it's called I'm Pressing the Space Bar and Nothing is Happening. Yeah, that, I, that's what happens to me too. The most often it's the space bar that gets jammed up. That gets <laughs> jammed up. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty fun, but it's also like it, it's Sad. clear that at this point, it's a real problem and not just like, oh, like 2% of the people have these problems unless we know that 2%. Because right now, I'm thinking, I think I saw maybe five or six computers from this generation or the previous, which are the 2016 and 2017, and they all had keyboard issues. So you were the last one I thought that did not have some, but yeah, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, and we're starting to... it's. The MacBook Escape is getting the, um, how do you call it? It's it's now the new uh, standard issued laptop at work, so I'm gonna yep. see a lot more, and we'll see if it works or doesn't work the keyboard for everybody. So talking about different laptops, uh, there's also one Mac that recently had its three years anniversary without any updates. Uh, that is the Mac Mini. So it's been now exactly this week three years since the Mac Mini was last updated. And people were, well, people are still sad because this is a very versatile machine. Uh, you can have it hooked as a uh, Mac server. You can use it as a uh, kind of a, a, a NAS, a kind of replacing a Synology, for example. You can use it to be a media server to broadcast media all over your house, uh, wire or wireless. So there's a bunch of ideas uh, and nice uh, novel uh, ideas for this computer. And there's even uh, hosting services you can get at Mac Stadium that are hosting websites and your web applications on the Mac Mini. So people were asking uh, the different execs at Apple about this. And one lucky guy uh, called, 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 called. Oh, his name is, uh, is uh, buffed out. So it's car something. He asked basically, I love the Mac Mini, but it's been over three years now without an update. Are we going to see anything in the pipeline anytime soon? Thanks. And he asked Tim Cook and Tim Cook res res responded. So I'm glad you love the Mac Mini. We love it too. Our customers have found so many creative, interesting uses for the Mac Mini. While it's not the time to share any details, we do plan for Mac Mini to be an important part of our product line going forward. So this kind of confirms that the Mac is not dead. But it's future speak, and that can be like in a year, in a month, or in three years. So for many, many, many people, uh, this is a problem because right now you can still buy a Mac Mini at the same price that it was released three years ago, so with components from three years ago. So it's, it's, a, it's a pain. At least if the price was going down and you can get a Mac Mini for 100 bucks, people would be running around and getting those because for that price, it would be hell of a computer. But now I'm looking at this, if you want to buy one, and in Canada, you can easily get into the $600 or $700 if you want to get it a little bit specced up. So still very expensive for something that's three years old. And you're in the market for a Mac Mini, right? Well, not really, but maybe. It's a computer that I always had an eye on, uh, looking at, okay, how much would it cost for me to replace my Synology with this and what new features can this give me and stuff like that. But I don't have a need for it. It's just that having this little Mac mini server in my house would be a fun project to do. So I'm always looking at prices, quotes, refurbish, just, just for fun, but it, it's not something I need for now. Uh, my Synology is way too big and way too powerful for what I do with it. So it would make sense for me to do that. So a few weeks ago, we discussed the uh, research blog that uh, Apple released, where they're going to share some of the research going on at Apple. And they added one more thing. Uh, they added exactly that. They added a article called uh, Hey Siri, an on-device DNN-powered voice trigger for Apple's personal assistant. So they basically go over exactly how uh, Siri works with a deep neural network to convert the acoustic pattern of your voice into 
a probability distribution over speech sounds. So basically try to understand what you're saying, how you're saying it, and matching it to a computer searchable query, basically. So it's, it's very interesting, as these things are, if you're, you like to understand how uh, the, the, the bacon is made, basically. And uh, yeah, the links will be in show notes if you want. It's, it's quite long, and there's a bunch of uh, graphics and patterns and stuff like that. So it's very research-oriented, but it's still, uh, I would say, clear enough that you can grasp the gist of it, uh, even though it's for researchers. In the last week, we also had um, a senator that was complaining that uh, Apple was not transparent enough using its Face ID technology, and that they should release uh, more details. So he basically asked Tim Cook ten questions that would uh, regarding Face ID, uh, and basically Tim Cook simply replied with links to the already existing knowledge base articles or marketing websites explaining exactly how uh, Face ID works how the tracking face works, how they save the information. And basically, once again, the senator was asking questions that were already uh, easy to answer by anyone who basically watched the keynote. So that really is useless in terms of questions. But nonetheless, Apple released a document called Face ID Security, where they go over exactly that uh, slide where they had in the keynote. And they said that uh, Touch ID was... uh, there was a, there was like a risk of it being compromised in one in fifty thousand, but now Face ID can be compromised in a chance out of one million, and that's a document that explains exactly how they go over to that uh, thing. It's not too long; it's only six pages, so it's it's very interesting to see exactly how he works, how the secure enclave does his magic, uh, what is accessible from outside and what is not. So I'm guessing that. Maybe this is also a response to that senator asking for details, but still, more information is never bad. So it's very interesting to read that kind of stuff, especially for six page, which is very short. So rumors are starting again. My favorite part of this whole Apple thing. The uh, rumor mail. Yeah. So the new rumors are that the the iPhone 8 is going to be cutting down on production about it in half. So I guess this is because they have to produce a new iPhone X, but then oh, see, I said it, iPhone X, iPhone X. I just they want X, they, they X, expect X. more people getting the iPhone X, 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 X than the iPhone eight. <laughs> and also, we saw news from the Rogers CEO. Rogers is a big um, telecom company here, and he says that the like the pre-orders for the iPhone eight was anemic, meaning like nobody is pre-ordering the phones. But we still see a couple in the wild. You were saying couple of your colleagues but i guess this yep. is all from people that are waiting for the iphone 10 10 10 10 10 10 well it's only because of the price because the two people at my workplace that i handled their phone one is a project manager and she has the iphone 8 and the other one is a dev manager who has the iphone 8 plus um, basically they're both their, their decisions ones because 1500 1600 dollars for an iphone makes no sense and already the iPhone 8 Plus, which is already like 1200 so it's it's already super expensive. But I, w- I would say that 1200 is kind of a, like, yes, it's expensive. Yes, I you need to do some amount of money to be able to afford this. But it's not as high as like 1500 which is a price people actually paid for the computers not too long ago. So if you're, you're like old like us in the 30s and you already paid... 1500 1400 1600 for a computer, it's very hard to think that you're going to shell out this amount of money for a phone. For an iPad Pro, maybe, because it's a, for many, it's a computer replacement. So if you go from a desktop to an iPad Pro and you do the iPad way of life uh, or multipad lifestyle, as they would say. <laughs> you about all it the can- hashtags. It- all the hashtags, yeah. Uh, basically, it makes sense. It, it, you can justify it in your brain. But if you have a computer and you have a phone and your phone is just a phone with games, some apps, social networks, whatever, does it really worth like $1,500 to $1,600? It's it's a big, a big leap. And I think that's what's holding back people. So people are just looking for a phone. They have iPhone 8 in stock. They just get a phone and that's it. 
Um, that's that's probably why we'll see it with the iPhone 10 how it's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see some shortage because, like you said, they did st- uh, uh, cut down the iPhone 8 production. So yes, to make more iPhone uh, iPhone 10, I almost said iPhone X. Yeah, so getting, more. Getting. Yeah, I'm trying very hard. <laughs> um, I should put a post it on my screen saying iPhone 10, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> so that that's probably why they're cutting down the production, but also. People are going to try to rush for the iPhone 10, And then, as I'm assuming it's going to happen, like it usually does with the most popular products. Remember the Jet Black last year was the same thing. Uh, it's going to be backordered and people will resolve to get an iPhone 8 instead. I'm starting to justify it in my head right now. This is how I see it. But the, there's, there's this theory that says, put your money where you spend time or something like that. So that's how they justify saying, pay more for your mattress. <laughs> <laughs> or pour, put your money where your mouth is? No, no, no. It's put put your money where you spend time, and I spend what like at least two hours in public transport, so that's all on my phone, and then at least another hour at home before going to bed, or in just general. So and then maybe a couple of, like fifty minutes here and there at work. So like four four or five hours a day. So I almost use this at my. I always I almost use it as much as my laptop. And the laptops are like 25 right now. So 15 for a phone is a deal. <laughs> it's a deal. Well, I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I had the same the, I had the same thought process for moving to the to an iPhone Plus because I mostly watch videos, TV series, YouTube stuff on my phone and also do workflows and lots of writing. So all of this benefit from a bigger screen. So for me, it was easy to justify it, even though it was more expensive. Uh, also, that at that moment, I had a couple hundred dollars uh, laying around because it was my birthday not too long ago. So I had a few hundred dollars to spare, and it was more than the difference between the non-plus and the plus. So I said, ah, it just makes sense. I have the money to spare, so just go for it. But this year, for me, it makes no sense because I got the plus last year. Well, last year, last November, so it's not even a year yet. And... It's another huge amount of money for something that I don't really need because it's the plus is already great for me. So it's very hard. If I, if I had like let's say an iPhone six or six S, then it would be a totally different uh, way of thinking because I would be so pressed to have an upgrade to enjoy the new features and everything and discover portrait mode, which I would have never discovered. So. I'm thinking that, yeah, it would be totally different. But f- f- for a year over year upgrade, it, it's a bit too much. Um, did you did you see the phone without the case? The iPhone 8, sorry? Uh, no, both had cases on it. Okay, go try one without the case. I really like the glass back, but like the the edges where the glass meets the the aluminum. Yeah, aluminum band, like on its... It's like this weird crack that annoys me. Okay. I really like the flush look of the iPhone 7, especially in jet black where it feels like nice. Yeah, jet black is the is the perfect finish. But uh, isn't there a crack there for like ease of handability, like to be able to, to get a good grip on it? No? No, it's just annoying. That's what the chamfered edge did with the iPhone 5s and 5S. So it was better to hold because that chamfered edge kind of helped you grip it properly. Yeah, but the chamfered edge was, was like all in the same material. Now it's like the cut between glass and aluminum and you really feel it. I, it, okay. it was just annoying. And it was just a way for me to justify that I don't need an 8 and then my 7 is fine. Okay. Understood. <laughs> so don't tell me it's it serves a purpose. It's just it's not good. It's a bad phone. Right. It'll be slow. Exactly. That's why you need a ten. And 10 just like your, no, it'll be worse because just like the MacBook Pros, it's a new generation, new model, new design, and there'll be hardware failures. Of but course, but there's nothing for it to stick. There's no keyboard, so there's not gonna be any dust nowhere. Mm, we'll see. I can open it with my eyes. Well, yes, but anyways, just just for that, it's worth the fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, me if and only. my fingers that don't work. I can just yes. look at it now. Yes, you tr- it's true. For you, there's an extra argument for that, being that Touch ID doesn't work for you. So 
Face ID might be the revelation you're looking for. But I'll knock on wood right now because both my thumbs have been working like flawlessly for maybe two weeks. Oh my God, that's like a, your, your top record. I know, I'm living like it's in 2014. <laughs> I'm finally in 2014. <laughs> Welcome. I see the right one isn't working now. Uh, they're both not working now. What did you do? <laughs> she just jinxed it. <laughs> yeah, it's done. I'm going to have to redo my thumbs again. Oh, uh, jeez. All right, so moving on to Review Corner. Uh, I, I have finally, finally, finally uh, published my review for the uh, sit-stand desk from Autonomous AI, the Smart Desk 2. Uh, this one has been a long time coming, uh, not just because it took a long time for me to get a review unit of that desk, but also because uh, for <laughs> for ordering reason, uh, I got the wrong color first, so then I didn't want to wait for... an this the second i got the, the black desk first with the black frame uh, i wanted the white desk with the black frame so i said uh, okay uh, forget about it we're just gonna assemble it anyways and try it and see exactly how it behaves and then i finally got the white top then i took an extra week or two then i decided to switch the the desk and then took more pictures and also and also did a couple of videos but the the end result was awful, so I have to redo those. So basically a bunch of excuses, but now it's finally published. So what is the Smart Desk 2? It's the uh, affordable, high-powered uh, sit-stand desk from Autonomous. Autonomous is a company whose main goal is to offer great product at affordable prices. I know it sounds like a sales pitch, but uh, if you look at their is. products, yeah, but it is, but it, it's also true because uh, usually you have uh, sit-stand desks that are like in above $1,000, if you want to get something that's motorized and it's fast to go from top to down and uh, with uh, nice uh, level adjustments and nice quality. And if you want something that's like below 500, usually it's crap. It's like either like a, like those Ikea ones where you have like a hand, uh, uh, hand mechanism that you have to turn like a, an old car from the 1900s. To, to, Ford to, Model T. Exactly. The exact same technology is in there. So, <laughs> so, it's so basically, proven. it's proven. Yeah, it won't get any dust in there. True, but if you want to stand up and it takes four minutes, it's not as fun as pressing a button and waiting like five seconds. Hey, you're gonna close those rings. It doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> it's my right hand, <laughs> my left one. Right. So yeah, basically, um, this one is motorized. I reviewed the business edition, which is the stronger of the two because there's the home edition which is more affordable but is also uh, less powerful and it raises about an inch per second and the business edition which is the one i have which is stronger raises about 2.3 inches per second so it's a <laughs> more do you really need that speed i don't think it's for the speed it's mostly for the strength because the uh, home edition has a um, capacity of 200 weight pounds limit? yeah weight limit of 200 pounds and the business one is 330 so you can get that sweet five monitors four monitors uh, set up that you want with a, a visa mount and everything so that will be uh, pretty nice on this desk uh, the desk itself it's made of wood so it's real wood with a uh, plastic lined on top uh, basically black white you also have a bamboo finish um, you also have um, another one that is oak so you have a bunch of the different uh, color choices but just be wary that in Canada, you don't have access to all of those. You have to check their websites. Uh, they have recently opened a, a warehouse in Toronto, so they are able to ship us uh, products faster and um, with cheaper shipping, but they don't have all the models, all of the colors. Because in terms of desk, you have the regular, the classic one, which is the one, is the one I got, but you also have like the ergonomic one, which has a cutout so you can fit yourself in the front and have your, uh, your elbows rest on the desk. There's also a, a wider, longer version. So it's about 50% uh, wider. So if you want a larger desk. And there was also another one that was uh, kind of a L shape, but I don't think we they have that anymore. So yeah, so basically uh, it does what it does. It stands up uh, and it goes down very fast uh, at <laughs> 2.3 inches per second. Uh, I really like the finish. Uh, the plastic finish is nice. The only thing is on the black desk, I realized that after a couple of weeks of use, my mouse was starting to scratch the surface. So it's not 
a super strong finish. So if you are aiming to get the black one, maybe protect it with some kind of uh, like a not a mouse pad, but like a desk pad, kind of like for those big gaming uh, uh, mechanical keyboards. Like they make super wide uh, desk pad. Um, yeah, so the the steel frame is very strong, very sturdy. Uh, the motor is not too loud, so that's great. Um, I usually go st to, to the standing position all day. I uh, basically never really used it sitting, uh, apart for a few times just for fun. But f when I use the desk itself, when I work from home, I just do it standing. So that's perfect for me. I even added a imprint. Uh, what you call that? Standing mat. Yeah, standing mat. So it's a squishy mat that you kind of saw probably in the past with, at those Canadian tires uh, stores or Walmart stores where the cashier is basically on a squishy mat uh, because they are standing all day. And that squishy mat usually uh, alleviates some of the pressure from your soles and your, your, your ankles and everything. So this really helps. Uh, I was able to do the full day without uh, any squishy mat. I tried also with my shoes and barefoot. Um, no problem. It's just that at the end of the day, if I didn't have the squishy mat, uh, basically uh, I would have some some little like pain in the in my soul. It's nothing unbearable. Just like something to realize that oh, I did stand all day on my uh, soul, and this kind of is not the best thing. But this squishy mat basically is a godsend. It's a uh, thick enough uh, with my weight. I have no problem. I don't think I reached the f full bottom of it. I can put all my weight on my e on a single heel and I can reach the ground. But if I'm standing on two on my two feet, I don't feel that I squished the mat completely. So it's sturdy doesn't enough, thick out. enough. Yeah, it doesn't bottom out. Um, so for the imprint, uh, uh, one thing I didn't like is that uh, the bottom side is uh, sticky. So kind of like a, the elevation stand or elevation uh, dock. Basically, you have a micro suction at the bottom. This uh, imprint product is the same. So if I want to remove it to sit down, for example, I really need to use my both my hands and pull it like if you were to pull a sticker out of a uh, a wall. Like it's very sticky to the ground. Like uh, it, it's it's gonna be even eventually it's gonna be less and less sticky the more the dust gets stick to it. So it's gonna help for my situation. Uh, I'm thinking that the product, the one I got, was probably more oriented for people on counters, like in kitchens or that need something that doesn't slip. Um, whereas for a computer setup, you need to be able to remove it fast. So I know you have an imprint, right, at work? Yeah, I had an imprint at work. Um, the now I don't have my standing desk anymore because I changed job and it's not available. But uh, the little mat was trying to crack. So I sent them an email and they sent me a new one. So they have a really nice uh, return and uh, not return, but I mean warranty policy. I think they're lifetime warranted. Nice. They just uh, told me, send me a picture. It was starting to like crack, like if it'd been in the sun for too long, but it was sitting in a in the machine room in the condo. So uh, I sent them an email and they sent me a new one. Nice. And um, for this one, it's not sticky on the ground, right? It's just nope. foam. Yeah. Mine was the commercial, no, pro, imprint professional, professional, <laughs> or commercial professional. And you have the, like the commercial, commercial or something like that. You have the bigger one. Mine was smaller. I have the commercial Couture Strata. So it also has like uh, lines on it. So it's kind of a textured uh, finish. So it doesn't slide as much, I would say, as the ones that I saw at my workplace. Uh, but also, it, it's it's more of a permanent solution. So it's the Com Cumulus Pro Commercial Couture Strata Series. Okay, I have the Cumulus Pro Professional. The difference between professional and commercial is the size and the stickiness, I guess. Yeah, that's probably the, the big difference there. So if you are looking for that, maybe look at the professional if you expect to be sitting once in a while. So mine is not really uh, apt for that. At the time I bought this, it was the the best one on wire cutter. But now they have these weird new ones with like uh, stuff that you can play with in the middle. I don't know if that's a good... No. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> no. If you check the wire cutter for the best adding mats, they have like... Um, the the mat is not flat. It has like, like half shapes, like balls and big sides. So, so you can play around and put your feet on them and play around with your feet all day it's supposed to be better 
Yeah, so they are not flat like you said. They are like curved. So you're kind of s standing in a uh, kind like of a bowl a shape. Pool. Yeah, a little pool. So you can put your heels up. You can put your toes up. You can move around like that. And there's also like a a circle size shape. It's it's like a it's like a mini skate park for your feet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a uh, and then their second the also great is the Commerce Pro commercial, the one I have uh, or the one you have. So yeah, they're both uh, also recommended. So the disc itself, uh just going back to the disc, uh has two holes for cables. And uh like I said it's all wood, so it's easy to set up a uh um Uh, I was about to say a boom arm, but boom arm don't, are not screwed to the wood, but more of a uh, monitor arm if you want to raise your monitor on a swivel arm. So that's easy to do because it's all wood. Um, yeah, uh, I have really nothing to, to say bad about this thing. Uh, there's four presets you can save for your height preferences. Uh, the first one for me is the sitting position. The second one is the standing position. And the third one is the standing position with the uh, mattress, uh, the mattress, the, with the mat. So I basically gain, uh, let me check. <laughs> Live. Yeah, so I went from 45.2 inch to 46 inch. So I gained about 0.8 of an inch. Uh, just because of the mat. So that's basically the difference I have. So the assembly is very simple. You have about 10 screws to, to do uh, with a little rubber gasket so that the vibration are absorbed by, by those little gasket. So you need to tighten your desk, not too much. Uh, when I exchanged from the black top to the white top, I did not need any instructions and I was able to do it like in five minutes. So the first time you just take your time because you don't want to screw things up, pun intended, and uh, you basically have the uh, com the controller to screw in, uh, the desk itself on the frame, and the uh, little control panel. So it's very simple. Uh, total, I think it was about 12 screws, so uh, very nice. Uh, also, I think you could manage to remove it and reinstall it without any problem. I don't recommend changing this too often. Uh, but the good thing is, if ever you are tired of this color, or if you did the wrong color choice, uh, it, it's basically just a frame that you can use on any type of surface. Uh, I would strongly advise you to probably weight the existing desk to see uh, what's its weight and try to find something similar so that you don't go over the limit uh, in terms of desk and monitor and accessories and everything that you put on your desk. But uh, yeah, the, the speed is excellent. The quality is great. Uh, for something that is so affordable. So yeah, the one I got is the Business Edition White Top. Uh, it's uh, $584 Canadian. So it's it's still very affordable uh, if you compare it to IKEA furniture. It's slightly more expensive and there's also uh, other models that are usually above $1,000. Uh, you can also customize it. So in Canada, you basically have a few Choices, you have the uh, black, walnut, bamboo, and white finish for the surface material for the desk. The uh, steel, they call it the platform, so basically the frame, which is either white, black, or gray. And you have two choices uh, of uh, the home or the business edition, basically. So visually, the home edition only has two sections in the legs, and the business edition has three. So probably there's more motors in there, so it's, they're stronger and faster. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy because when I got the desk uh, like uh, two months ago about, uh, there was only the black and white uh, that you can choose from. So there's no uh, ergonomic or wider choices though. For Canada, it's only the uh, classic size, but you still have the four colors, which is pretty nice. And if you ever, you ever want something else to go with that, they also have like a bunch of accessories. So they are known for their uh, their smart Well, they say they call it smart office. So there's the Ergo chair, which is basically like a premium chair that usually goes over a thousand bucks that is available for 450 Canadian. So it's very affordable. And it has a special mechanism when you, that you can, you know, people at work usually uh, after a while, they just lean back. So you have kind of a, like a lazy boy position if you want. Well, this chair has a special mechanism that allows you to swivel Uh, the seat and the the desk uh, the the back thing uh, together so kind of like in a, a it's weird to explain but it's kind of a 
like a, like a swing. Basically, you just swing yourself and everything moves uh, uh, together. So it's quite original. They also have like a mini version. So if you don't have a standing desk, but you want to benefit from the standing desk, they have this little thing that can be installed on top of your desk and allows you to raise and lower uh, on a single uh, arm thing. It even has a visa mount uh, integrated. So it's pretty great. And does it wobble from left to right when you type? When it's extended to to standing position? Not at all. Uh, uh, when when it's standing and I put my weight on it, or yeah, when it moves up. Type. Uh, no, typing no. If I put my my, my whole weight on it on my elbows, for example, uh, it does shake a bit, uh, but uh, no, it's it's pretty stable. Even going up and down, uh, if you have a glass of water or a coffee, it barely moves. Yeah, so basically Smart Desk 2 from Autonomous is uh, highly recommended by me. Uh, I've already recommended this product for many people in the past and uh, at least one of them purchased it and it was he was pretty happy with it, so that's great. Uh, they also have a Smart Desk version 3 coming. It's already available in the US. It's basically the same thing uh, with slight cosmetic changes, but it also integrates like a little tablet inside of the desk itself. And it has all of those uh, new trendy uh, health and fitness features like stand up, uh, take a walk, uh, drink some water, uh, here's your appointments for the day and stuff like that. So it's kind of a smart assistant with some health related features. Not sure when it's coming to Canada, but uh, it should eventually come here. All right. So that's it for RGBA number 67. You can find the show notes at rgba.fm slash 67. Follow the links uh, there. You can follow us on Twitter uh, at underscore RGBAFM. I'm V-A-L-L-I-E-R-E-S on Twitter. And I'm Tyler Menard, T-Y-L-E-R-M-E-N-A-R-D. So give us a recommendation on uh, Overcast. This seems to be what uh, the folks are asking nowadays. Uh, <laughs> the new rate us on iTunes. Yeah, it's a new rate us on iTunes. If you also want to rate us on iTunes, please go ahead. Uh, but I'm hearing, I'm hearing that uh, mostly people get new subscribers, new listeners from Overcast most uh, of all. So, yeah, basically, uh, thumbs up for us and uh, see you next week. See you next week.